I want to read a couple of things. It's from a Bible, and uh, it has nothing to do with the message tonight. Okay? Ecclesiastes 7.29 says, The Lord made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. That's what it says in the KJ. I looked this up. And the word invention means mental fabrications. A fabrication is a lie. A mental fabrication is something you think in your mind that's not right, not true, and might even be evil. God made men upright. They've sought out many mental fabrications. Okay. Micah 7.19 says, Micah 7.19, He will subdue our iniquities. I looked that up in the Hebrew. You know what it says? He will stamp on them. You got some things you can't uh, handle, some sin that's plaguing you, ask God to stamp on them because that's what it says He will do. Then fasting, Matthew 6.16, we mentioned that before. And uh, anyway, just some thoughts that I thought I would pass on to you. Well, this evening, with God's help, I want to speak on the subject of our relationship with Christ. It's not a relationship with religion. It's a relationship with a person. All the way through. First of all, Ephesians 1.4 we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, which means before God made the world, He chose us. I can't sp explain that satisfactorily perhaps to you. I believe it because the Bible says so. He did it before He made the world. You see, God doesn't have any last-minute plans, you know, or any backup plans either. God knows the end, the Bible says, from the beginning. Chosen in Christ. Okay? Then we're saved by Christ. 1 Timothy 1.18, Paul said, This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. And so if you're a Christian, you are a saved sinner. Some people don't like that word because they don't know that they're lost. If they knew they were lost, they would appreciate the word saved. And we appreciate it because we know what we were saved from. In Ontario one time, I was driving and listening to a program, and the, there was a couple of guys, a couple of preachers apparently, and so the guy was asking, as I just turned the program on, he was just asking them, now you're the guys that uh, are telling us worldlings uh, that we have to be saved. Okay, saved from what? And saved to what? And they couldn't tell him. And then, you know, I just wish I could leap into that studio, you know. They couldn't, they couldn't tell him either, you know. It was sad. Our kids in Sunday school would know more than they knew. Saved by Christ. Sealed by Christ to the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30, 2 Corinthians 1.22. By the way, we have some copies of the uh, scripture we'll be using tonight here in the front pew. Help yourself at the end of the meeting. Sealed by Christ to the day of redemption. What is the day of redemption? The day of redemption is the day of the second coming of Christ. Our souls have been redeemed. Our bodies are not yet redeemed. They will be redeemed. Our body will be redeemed at the coming of Christ. And we have been sealed to that event by Christ. We have been anointed by Christ in 2 Corinthians 1.21. Every Christian has an anointing on him or her. There is something that only you can do for God, that is. And many times Christians go through all their life not even realizing they have been anointed by God, not thinking about it, and finding the Christian life pretty dull because 
They're not really walking with God, and consequently, they never see anything happen. And they begin to wonder, even if God exists, Then the Bible, you know, it has some references to Christ in you. I think eight or nine. Christ in you. It's got many, many references to us being in Christ. He's in us. We're in Him. Then the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Do you know that you're joined to Christ? You're, you're part of Christ? Listen to it again. He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. You become one with Christ. That's what it says. Then we read in Revelation 21.9, well, I'll explain what happened. An angel came to the Apostle John and said, Come with me, come hither, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, referred to 31 times in the New Testament Scriptures, 29 of them in the book of Revelation. Now you figure out why. It means that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is in control of everything. The Most High God, it says in Daniel three times, the Most High God rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomsoever He will and sets up over it the basis of men. Now I can't explain that, but God's in control of all the so-called accidents of history, all of history. History is, remember, his story. Joined to Christ, we are the bride of Christ, and so he showed John, not a big church gathering, but the holy city, descending from God out of heaven. And that tells me, and should tell you, that someday, we're going to be together, all of God's children, in a city called the New Jerusalem. It's written of Abraham that he looked for a city which has foundations. He means eternal foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The Bible says in Revelation, the cities of the nations will fall, including Winnipeg. Every city in the world one day will fall. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Everything you have, remember, everything you have will be incinerated and just disappear. And uh, if you're a lazy Christian, what are you going to say to your friends? And I say, hey, John, look, my fire is higher than yours. That's about all some Christians will be able to say, you know. A higher fire than their brothers. We're the bride of Christ. We are married to Christ, it says in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. We are married to Christ so that we might bring forth fruit unto God. If you're married to Christ and joined to Christ, then we do the things that Christ wants us to do. Remember in Ezekiel, he saw a strange apparition, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. The wheel is Christ. He's the big wheel. The wheel in the middle of the wheel is you and me. We're little wheels. And the little wheel has got to stay with the big wheel or you get in trouble. If you don't stay with the big wheel, the road will be rough. And you may even get lost. Can't find your way. Because you didn't like the ride you were having with the big wheel, Christ. But you're joined to the Lord, one spirit with Him. Second Corinthians 3.3 3 says that we are living epistles of Jesus Christ. The world doesn't read our Bible. I heard somebody say one time, a Bible in the hand is just two on the shelf. But many have Bibles in their house that they never read. 
We Christians are the only epistle that the world reads. And they look at it. You know, Paul said, we are made a spectacle. The Greek word is theatron, from which we get the English word theater. We're made a spectacle of theater to the world, to angels, and to men. Whether we like it or not, we are on stage. You are on stage, whoever you are. And you are being watched. That's why the Bible says, see that, that you walk circumspectly. The word has the idea of looking all around. Carefully, exactly, other translations say. So, we're to walk very carefully because we're on stage and the world and angels and demons and men are watching us. To see how we do it. And many, remember that verse in the Psalms. He has set my feet on a rock. And established all my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. And the result? Many will see it and fear and trust in the Lord. So you're on stage. A living epistle of Jesus Christ. We're members of his kingdom already, you know, Colossians 1. It says, we have been delivered. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom of Christ is already here and we're in that kingdom already if we're one of God's children. The kingdom of Christ is here. When Christ returns in Matthew 13, He's going to send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, a blast that will be heard around the earth. And they will gather, it says, out of his kingdom. His kingdom's already here. But it's not, it's got a lot of other junk in it that shouldn't be here. And stuff that shouldn't be here. So they will gather out of his kingdom. I put it this way, they're going to dry clean the world. The angels are going to dry clean the world. And everything that's offensive to God will be taken up and incinerated and burned. And those who are not believers will be hurled, it says, into the lake of fire. And that says this, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Are you going to shine brightly in that day? Well, if you haven't been shining now, you may not. But the righteous will shine forth. Now we're back numbers. They don't even know we're here. But in that day, we will not be back numbers. We'll be the only ones, the Christians from all the ages, Old Testament, New Testament, here, members of his kingdom. And the object of his love, Galatians 2.20, we know the verse well, but there's something about it we maybe didn't notice. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, and here's the part we neglect, who loved me and gave himself for me. That verse was a great encouragement to me many years ago because he used to think, well I'm only one of millions so it doesn't really matter I mean, God doesn't really need me there's millions of Christians in the world and all of this but this hit me like a bombshell one day many years ago Christ loved me and gave himself for me and as I said in one of the other sessions the nails did not keep Christ on the cross in a quarter of a second or a hundredth of a second, he could have been off that cross had he wanted to. It was his love for us that kept him nailed to the cross. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And we know what the end was. He loved us. We're the object of his love. Second Corinthians 12, 19 says, We speak before God in Christ when you're witnessing you're witnessing in Christ before God 
Keep that in mind. People often are afraid to witness because they don't know their Bible well enough. Well, whose fault is that? Do you have one? What about all that other stuff you spend hours with? You know, the, the poop tube, and then all these other books you have, you read, spend hours with them. And read the Bible, how much? Maybe a chapter a day. I'll never forget, you've heard me say, some of you have heard me say this before, but as a pastor in Saskatoon before the revival, I passed out little sheets one Sunday morning. Nobody had to sign their name, so everybody was honest. And that's what I wanted. Questions like, how much time a day do you spend reading the Bible? How much time a day do you spend in prayer? Do you ever witness about Christ to others? How many people have you led to Christ? Do you tie your income? And questions of this nature. I got them all back. None of them signed, of course. But you're honest. I'll tell you, when I got them back, I wish I'd never done it. I couldn't believe it. Numbers of people in our congregation were Bible school graduates. Everybody loved God and the gospel, but nobody was talking it. Everybody loved missions and nobody was doing it, you know. That was a shocking thing to me. People, five minutes a day, pray. Five minutes a day, reading the Bible. And one guy put down reading the Bible, 30 minutes a day. And then his conscience smote him, and he stroked it off, and he put a big zero on the paper, you know. That's when I started praying for revival. You know, I saw we needed it desperately. I couldn't believe it. You know, they were good people. They loved me. They were kind to my wife and me. You know, our family and all this. They loved to hear good preaching and all this stuff. You know, but that's often the way it is, and that's why we need an awakening in the power of the Spirit of God. We speak before God in Christ, and then we are His workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are His workmanship, because we're not saved by works, our works. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. Not just created in Christ, but created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. Every Christian should be involved to some extent, somehow, somewhere, in some of the work of God. There's something for all of you. We said it before. I say it again tonight. There's something you can do. There's something only you can do. Nobody can do the thing that God has in mind for you as his child. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, and the word means motion to war, unto good works. Which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Ordained. When Paul was writing to Titus, who was pastoring a church, he said, Titus, be careful to exhort the people who have believed in God that they maintain good works. It doesn't say good Christian works. You know, sometimes there's things going on in the community for the good of the community, and Christians back off. They don't have anything to do with that. It's not Christian. It doesn't say just Christian works. We should be involved in anything that's going on in the community. That's one of the big beefs, you know, the world has about evangelicals. They never get behind anything going on in the community. If there's something good, get in there. Let them know you're concerned. Do what you can. It would help the testimony of the gospel, I am sure. Now, Philippians 2.12, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, among whom you shine as lights. You're not working for your salvation, you have salvation, but you're working it out on the moral and the spiritual level to the glory of God. So, get busy, not buzzy, busy for God. Be steadfast, remember, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. In the Lord, because you're serving a living Christ, and His word never returns empty, as Isaiah told us. Then we are circumcised 
by hand, by an act of God, it says without hands in Colossians chapter 2. And what did he do? He circumcised our heart. And he took that body, all that sins of the flesh that we were guilty of, and he took it away. And it's gone forever. And so, Stephen said to those people that were about to kill him, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your which of the prophets have not your your fathers prosecuted? And they have slain them who said before about the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers, who received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. And then the stones began to fly. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. Yeah, we need to have circumcised ears and circumcised eyes to be careful as to what we watch and what we listen to as children of God because we're on stage. Then it says in Colossians 3, 4, He is our life. That's not exactly what the Greek said. The Greek says, He is. Wait a minute. I got it wrong for a minute here. It sometimes happens. Here's our life. I'll come back to that in a minute. He is our wisdom. First Corinthians 1.30 says, Christ who of God is made unto us wisdom. So you have the wisdom of Christ in you. You may not know that. You may not show it because you don't know it. That's why it says in James 1, 5 to 8, If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. I mean, you've got the wisdom living within you, ask of God. That gives to all men liberally, and doesn't upbraid them or reproach them for asking, but let him ask in faith, it says, nothing wavering. For he that wavers like the wave of the sea, driven on the wind and tossed, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He is our life, our wisdom. Then it says He is our righteousness. You know, some Christians don't know that righteousness is a gift from God. It's called the gift of righteousness in Romans chapter 5. It's a gift from God. Isaiah knew about it because he talked about putting on the robe of righteousness. It's not your righteousness, it's His. In the Old Testament, the Lord, our righteousness in Jeremiah, Jehovah said, King, He is our righteousness. You don't have any of your own. We have His righteousness put to our account. And that's the only way. You remember the parable Jesus told about a king, and he made a wedding and a marriage for his son. And later on, the king came in to see the guests. And he found there a man who didn't have a wedding garment on. In those days, in some countries, and even today in some countries I understand, when you go to a wedding, you're handed a wedding garment, a cloak thing, you put on at the door. Everybody has to do that. They provide it. You're supposed to wear it. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who didn't have a wedding garment on. And he said to him, How did you come in here not having a wedding gun? I hear people saying, Boy, when I get up before God, if there is one, I'm going to shake my fist in his face and tell him off. No, you're not. You know what happened in this account? What did the guy say? It says he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him out into outer darkness. So righteousness is a gift of God through Jesus. It's his perfect righteousness. He lived a perfect life, remember? Over and over the New Testament tells us he had no sin. When they said to him, and they were insinuating he was born of fornication, they said, We are not born of fornication. Now, 
He handled that in a kind of a neat way. He didn't talk about that at all. He just said, which of you convinces me of fornication? That's what he said. Well, of course, none of them could. He knew no sin. He was separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. And his perfect righteousness is put to your account and mine in the bank. So you're not trusting in what you're doing. We should be doing for God, but not thinking that's going to put us in some special relationship with God or maintain our salvation or something. That's just not it. Righteousness, I say, is the free gift of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, He is also our sanctification. Salvation comes first, then sanctification follows. Sanctification is the outworking of our salvation. And Paul prayed in 1 Thessalonians 5, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it. We should be concerned about our sanctification. Christ prayed in John 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. The word really means set apart. He is our sanctification. He is our redemption, it says. In the same chapter 1 of First Corinthians, He is our redemption, verse 30. I've said this before too, may I say it again? Salvation, dear people, is not a plan. It's a person. And sometimes we try and get people saved with a plan. It never works out well, you know. You're saved by a person. And that person is Christ. It's called the gospel of Christ, right? And if Christ is not in it, it's not the gospel. I hope they have reruns in heaven. They let Spurgeon preach a couple of sermons and maybe Whitfield and some others besides. They said to Spurgeon, you know, he, was such, he had such a gift for speaking that people who studied this, they always advised the student to hear Spurgeon as often as they could. They weren't thinking of the gospel at all. But he had such a tremendous command of the English language. So he's asked to speak at political rallies and other rallies and in behalf of different organizations. And he would do that with one proviso, that they would always let him preach the gospel at the end for at least five minutes. And almost every time he did, souls found Christ. One of his brothers, you know, arranged for open-air meetings for Charles Spurgeon. And as I was reading what he was saying, I had a quick reading. I mean, the tears were just flowing. I couldn't believe it, you know. 10,000, 15, 20,000 people in the open air? No living preacher could do that today. I mean, some preachers get big crowds with 150 or 300 buses bringing people in. And Spurgeon said they all walked, you know. And if they knew he was in an area, everything stopped. The stores closed, the school stopped. Everybody got out as quickly as they could to hear him speak. And he preached the gospel. And his brother said, at times, the, the power of God was so great, he had to stop. So many people were falling on their faces and calling on God for forgiveness and for salvation. He said it was incredible, the things that went on. After a communion service, he stood there and he talked about Jesus. There was a guy sitting with a friend who was not a Christian. And he said, he's talking like Jesus is standing beside him. I don't see anybody standing beside him. I guess not. And they criticized him and he said, listen, Jesus is real. Jesus is real. And when he died, what did he say to Suzanne as he was dying? He said, oh, wifey, he said, I've had such a great time with my Lord. That's how he died. Well, some tourists came from the States. They wanted to hear Dr. Popper, this famous London preacher, and they wanted to hear Spurgeon. 
So did her book. They were asked their opinion. Oh, they said, Parker, what a preacher, man. What a preacher. We haven't heard anything like it. What about Spurgeon? Spurgeon has a great Savior. That was a difference. You know that some elections in England were settled by what Spurgeon said from the pulpit. He didn't get involved in politics and all of that. But when some big moral issue was before the public, he let the public know what he thought and they vote the way he thought, you know, oftentimes. Well, he's our life, our wisdom, our sanctification, our righteousness, our redemption, and then he's our peace, Ephesians 2.14. You know, there was a time described that way by Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. When we are Gentiles... We had no relationship, we had no God, it says, and no Christ, and no promises, and no country to live in, no earth, that is no spiritual country. We really had nothing. He says, but now, but now it's different. He is our peace, who has made both one, that is both Jew and Gentile one. You know, when you become a Christian, you actually become a spiritual Israelite. Did you know that? A lot of people don't believe that. It's very clearly taught in the Bible. Very clearly. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. In the, in the spirit, not in the letter. Whose praise is not of men but of God. And other places, you know, God only has one olive tree. Did you know that? He doesn't have two families. He just has one. The Bible speaks about the whole family of God in Ephesians chapter 4 in heaven and earth. So, he has one olive tree. And if you become a Christian as a Gentile, you're grafted into that Jewish Israelite tree. Did you know that? Well, it's in the Bible. You better know it. And you know, when he talked about in Revelation uh, 21, about the bride, the Lamb's wife, and the holy city coming down, the holy city had 12 gates. Now remember, this is the bride, the Lamb's wife, of which you are a part, I hope. Why do I mention that? Because there were 12 gates, and in each gate was the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, which gate are you going to go by if you don't believe in a spiritual Israel? Are you going to be airlifted in somehow? No. You have to go, you're going to have to go through one of those gates with the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Dear people, there is, I know, but many writers, they fulminate against this idea. They're ignorant of what the Bible is really saying. I can't, this is a, should be a message all by itself when I can't do that tonight. He is our peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything comes back to Christ. Everything comes from Christ. All of those promises of God in the Bible, of which, remember, there are 7,487, they were all the promises of God in Christ are yea and amen to the glory of God. He came to ratify the promise. Romans 15 says, Christ ratified those promises and made them real for Jew and Gentile alike. And He is our peace. Colossians 2.10 says, You are complete in Him. Does that ring your bell? You are what? You are complete. In Christ. Just the way you are right now. You're complete. The Greek word there means you are made fullness. You're full full. You're complete. In Christ. Some Christians go all their life trying to get complete in Christ. But the Bible says we are complete in Christ. And it's because of all these things we've been looking at here today. Colossians 3.11 says, Christ is all, and in all. That is an all Christian. He's all I need. We sing that in one of our songs. He's everything I need. He's all I need. 
If you're thinking of being filled with the Spirit, remember, He's often called the Spirit of Christ. I hear people saying, Jesus Christ never talked against homosexuality. I said, yes, He did many times. Where in the Bible? In 1 Peter chapter 1, Christ said, or the Bible says, Peter said, that the Spirit of Christ was in all the Old Testament prophets. So when Moses wrote about homosexuality, that was Christ speaking. And all those references in the Old Testament homosexuality, none of them flattered their kind, you know, kindly. It was Christ speaking through the prophets. We need to know that. They say ignorance is bliss. When ignorance is bliss, it's fine to be wise. But, I tell you, to be ignorant of the things of God and what the Bible really said, we need to get into this book, dear people, find out what it says. Read it by the hour. When I was first converted, I, I was 22 or so years old. I, no, I was younger than that a little bit. I'm not sure the exact time, but I know. It was in June, the month of June. I couldn't find steady work. I did get a job uh, for 21 cents an hour, one place, and then I got a job working for a dollar a day, and then the boss used to take a buck a week off all the workers, When I found out I just quit, you know. Anyway, when I got converted, I started reading the Bible. And God gave me, I take no credit for this, God gave me such a love for the Bible, we didn't have any books in the house to begin with. We didn't have any tapes and all this stuff, you know. I had nothing but the Bible. I read it six, eight, ten, twelve hours a day. Sometimes my mother called me for dinner and I said, Forget it, mother, I'm not coming, you know. I just couldn't leave the Bible alone. And I raced to the Bible, read it all. Then I went through it the second time, and at the top of every page, I, I wrote something that I found in the Gospel of Mark. It was, Have faith in God. I saw the Bible somewhere at home, you know. Have faith in God, have faith in God, have faith in God. So when I read that Bible, it just stared me in the face. Every page of the Bible, have faith in God. You know. It was a tremendous help to me. But God did that, and I'm only a Christian a year, and they asked me to become a pastor of a church. I never baptized, I wasn't even baptized myself. I never baptized anybody. I would never married anybody. I hadn't had a funeral for anybody. I hadn't had a business meeting. I didn't know anything. But you know what? They were hard up. <laughs> and so they got me. And then God did something that first year, and about 70 people got converted, including some who went to the mission field. Just something God did to show us His power, I'm sure. Christ is all and in all, in you. Everything you need is in Christ. Don't try and get something apart from Christ. It's all in Him. Everything is, you know. Christ in you, it says, the hope of glory in Colossians. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Did you know that someday, one day, God is going to sing to you? That's in the Bible too, you know. Anybody know where it is? That's right. That's right. And it's going to be a trio. Right? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's got to be a trio. And after they sing their song to us, they won't have any souls trying to sing in heaven because, you know, a solo is in comparison to the Trinity singing. It'll be like a bull moose of bad cold and foot caught in a bear trap. <laughs> The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. That's what it says in Zephaniah chapter 3. I'm really looking forward to that, you know. You know, sometimes somebody sings and gives a man, what a voice. Jesus said, out of the mouth of babes and sufferings, God has perfected praise. The best singing comes from kids, little kids, you know, as far as God is concerned. We can never impress God with our preaching or our singing. Impossible. 
This God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. But Diamond said, are you letting him guide you? He wants to guide us into truth as well, you know. The Bible speaks about the present truth. That's before the Bible was completed. It talked about the present truth. The truth up until now. There was other truth to come. And Christ said, I have many things to say to you. It's not to the twelve, but you cannot bear them now. How be when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And he's done that. We have a completed Bible now. God, who at sundry times and different manners spoken time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in his last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And he's our Savior. And we're joined to him, and we're married to him. And with the object of his love, Calvary was for you. Calvary was for me. We must never forget it, dear people. It does say, Ephesians 5.18, Be filled with the Spirit. But if you're praying for that, you know, a certain man who became a very well-known American preacher was in a meeting and they were preaching about the Holy Spirit and they invited anybody who wanted to be filled with the Spirit to go forward. So he went forward. Now, prayed a few minutes, went back to the seat. A friend of his sitting behind him said, uh, Why did you go forward? I went forward to be filled with the Spirit. Oh, uh, were you filled? Yes, I was. How do you feel? I didn't ask for fear. I asked for the Lord. Oh, as the people are waiting for something fancy, you know, something great to happen, big, big things. I don't know why people who bear like a donkey think they're filled with the Spirit. It doesn't make any sense to me. Make any sense to you? You know? Were they more like a lion? Not supposed to be the lion of the tribe of Judah? You know? Ooh, I better stop before I get in trouble. All right. What do we do with all this? What do we do with it? Does it make any change in your thinking that we're so joined to Christ in all of this? He could never forget us. We're part of Him, part of His body, part of His kingdom, part of Him personally. He can never forget us, and He never does, no matter what happens. You know, Sam Jones was a famous American preacher. He was a contemporary of Moody's, and they were both in the same city at the same time by reason of bad planning. He always got a bigger crowd than Moody did. So he used to trick Moody. He said, Moody, you're going to have my overflow. They loved each other. They were good pals. Well, he came to... Um, Sacramento, California, which in his day was a number one hellhole in America. When he got there, the pastors in the area had a meeting with him and said, Now, Sam, listen, you can't preach here the way you've been preaching in the place in America because if you do, there'll be a riot and people will get killed. He didn't make any promises. The first night on the platform, the pastors were all behind him on the platform, and he said to people, now these men sitting on the platform behind me, they told me I can't preach here what I've been preaching in the rest of the United States of America. If you think Sam Jones is scared, you don't know Sam Jones. So he preached the way he always did. At the end of the week, of what revival broke, underworld characters were getting saved, policemen were getting saved, bootleggers were finding Christ. So the underworld got their hands together and hired five men to take this and go down to the hotel and bump them off when they came out for the meeting that next night. Somebody tipped the preachers off, so they went down in their body to the hotel and got into his room and said, Sam, we're ending it all. Ending what? I mean, no, you're not. Yes, we are. How can you? Why? What's, what's this all about, you know? There's five men that are in the fire right now, each man on the pistol hand, waiting for you. Oh, really, he said? Gentlemen, goodbye. He walked out the door. They saw him come to the uncle ready with the pistols, you know. He, he walked straight from here. Here's what he said. You know what I got him? You know what happened? They split like the Red Sea split.
threat for the rod of Moses. And I walked right through them and nobody pulled the trigger. It got so hot in Sacramento finally that the sheriff closed it down. So many people were being converted. The underworld was really in trouble because they were losing all kinds of their people, you know. But Jones, he loved God with all his heart. He used to be an alcoholic. And uh, years after, in the ministry, he, one night in a hotel, the old lust for liquor returned. And he had to battle it for hours. He, he said he, he knelt at the bed praying, and he ran to the door, and then he because there was a beer bottle down the hall, back to the bed, back and forth six or eight times, and finally he threw his body across the bed. And he said, "Hey God, can't you do a better job than this?" And he was instantly released, and it never ever returned. And sometimes you know, we have to pray in a desperate way. You know, he understands, and you're a part of him. You're not just some kind of religious figure, you know. You're part of him. And he loves you with an everlasting love. He told us that in Jeremiah, you know. So we need to know this. Let no situation should engulf you or bother you or worry you. Billy Sunday was the same with so many people, you know. I think it was in Pittsburgh. One of those, it was in Pennsylvania somewhere. When the crusade ended, there had been 40,000 men converted who quit drinking beer. And the liquor interest hated them with a passion, you know. They hired people, if he was going to Minneapolis and they knew about it, they would send a team to Minneapolis, first of all, three months before he got there, to spread lying stories about Billy Sunday all through the city. When the crusade was on, he might be there a month or two months, they wouldn't say anything. When the crusade was over and Billy Gandhi did the same thing again. I met people in the States who thought Billy Sonny had five, five wives and was a multi-millionaire and all this. I said, it's garbage. No, 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 we heard it from the so. It wasn't true at all, you know. He didn't care, couldn't care less. He just served God, loved God. It was all of a sudden, you know, every time he preached, do you know where he put his sermon notes? On Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. That's the verse Christ quoted at Nazareth. That almost cost him his life. He knew Jesus Christ in a very personal way. He'd been a drunkard at one time. And God changed all that. There's only Jesus Christ can. But I'm still asking the question and thinking about it. What are we going to do with all of this? Are we going to believe it and apply it day by day? And realize you're a son of God, a child of God. We're special people to Him. And God has things He wants to do to, to every one of us. I was such a shy person when I got saved, you know. Well, I was shy long before that. I never walked on the sidewalks because if I saw somebody coming on the sidewalk, I'd cross the street. So I'd avoid man, woman, or child. I had to cross the street to avoid meeting them. And um, then I became a Christian. And I was working in a pulpwood camp at Pine Falls, Manitoba, and one night, you know what happened? A horrible thing. God called me to preach. I argued with him all night. I said, God, you know better than that. Is this a joke or something? You know? I said, you know better than that. I can't do this. But he nailed me to the wall with the verse in the Bible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And every time I open my big mouth, he just pushed that in, you know. After about ten times, I, I, got, I saw the light. I said, okay, God, I'll do it. I know nobody ever asked me to speak, so I was the least bit concerned. But I promised I'd speak anywhere anybody asked me. And, and horrible, you know what happened? About two weeks later, a church in Winnipeg here asked me to speak. Oh. You have, you have no idea the qualms I went through. I, I chose First Corinthians chapter 12 because it was a long chapter and I thought if I'm persecuted one verse I can flee to another, you know. And when I got up there to speak there were 30 people sitting there 30 pairs of eyes all looking at me. I almost vanished. But somehow I held on to the pulpit with all my might. And I preached for 20 minutes and going home walking home I was leaping off the sidewalk hollering, Hey God, 
We did it. I didn't say I did it. We did it. I couldn't witness to anybody because I couldn't get the words out anymore. <clears throat> so I wrote to a lumberjack friend of mine, told him how I'd been saved, suggested he get saved. I got a letter back. He said, I got your letter. It really rocked me. He said, I sat on my horse. I rode off in the bush. I read your letter the second time. I read your letter the third time. And then I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Then, then I wrote to another fellow in a military camp in Nova Scotia, and he wrote back to say he'd accepted Christ. You know what happened then? I found I could talk and get away with it. I didn't know any of these things then. All I knew was I was saved. I didn't know Christ was my life, my wisdom, my righteousness, my sanctification, my redemption, my peace. I didn't know any of that stuff, you know. I began to learn as I read, you know. But somehow I made it because I am his and he is mine forever and forever. That's what it says. People get into the Bible, get to know it. Kurt Bork, some of you know him. He knows many chapters of the Bible off by heart. Poetry pours out of them. But he's been a champion and missionary for years, preaching in bush camps, doing the hard thing, and he just loves God. Wrote a book on his life, you know. You don't learn all of this at once, but somewhere we have to learn it and somehow become men and women of God. One of the favorite Bible terms for Moses was Moses, the man of God. Would anybody say that if you or me? He or she is a man or a woman of God? They might have a hard time figuring the term out if they knew as well. Anyway, by faith, we have to accept all of this and just, you know, don't let it clutter your mind to the point that you, it's too big. You don't want to do that. But it's there. And I would, I would just like to take this one verse, Christ, you see that verse back in Colossians, I said it come back to it, I'm back to it now. The KJ says, Christ who is our life. But that's not what the Greek says. The Greek, the Greek says, Christ our life. That's enough to keep me going for another thousand years. Christ our life. You are dead. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. So when the trumpet blows and he appears, we will appear with him in his image and likeness, for we shall see him as he is. So we haven't said it all yet. There's more in the Bible. But we said enough, I think, for tonight. He that has a son has life. And he that has not the Son of God has not life. That's the gospel. Simple. Not hard to understand and not hard to explain. Live for Christ. Love Him, praise Him, try to win others to Christ. You never know who's looking for the Lord that you happen to bump into. There's a way of finding out. Carry tracks, give them politely to people, offer them to people. Whatever way you can to further the kingdom of God, take advantage of the people. If all of this is true, it should make a radical difference in every one of our lives. It should. And to some extent, of course, it does. And I'm sure not to the extent that it ought to.